Awards are often misleading. Influential people who mysteriously happen to have the same opinions, Just at least publicly, brave. and use oh, the same buzzwords and platitudes, are giving each other titles in order to maintain their power in society and control the narrative, the right opinions and the correct way of speaking, from politics and media to the education system and workplaces. Last year, Meghan and her now husband received the Ribble of Hope Award for their unwavering commitment to social change. Looking at some of the previous winners of this award, Fauci, Kaepernick, Pelosi and the two presidents, there's no true diversity. They're part of the same popular group, sharing a similar worldview. One of the ways a worldview continues to get favored over other worldviews is via award shows. When someone's awarded, it makes many or most ordinary people think that he or she speaks the truth. Eventually then, the popular group's opinions are glorified, and opposing views are labeled exclusive, intolerant or outdated, even though the people in this group constantly repeat how inclusive they are. The group will then have achieved what it set out to achieve, power. The nice sounding, carefully chosen words that a lot of people unfortunately still fall for was simply the means to get there. When people know that they're actually exclusive, it's about blaming other people for being exclusive first so as to avoid the accusation, which isn't only immature thinking, but also classic projection, projection with a career advancing and thus financial incentive. This exclusivity masked as inclusivity is evidenced by all the people with wrong opinions who are getting fired from their jobs, being marginalized in the education system and cast out of the entertainment industry. In pop culture, the unimpressive ability to regurgitate cliches has replaced true bravery and largely replaced talent and merits. The people in this group like to call each other brave in order to control the narrative of what's to be considered brave. However, there's nothing brave about repeating platitudes and going along with whatever's trending this week. Megan receives so many awards that she can't always be physically present at the shows to accept them all. Megan and the person she lives with had to skip the People's Choice Award for the larger Ribble of Hope show. Megan won the People's Choice Award for her podcast. Because, without a doubt, that was the people's choice. It was an organic win, no doubt. Megan said she loved digging deep into meaningful conversation with her diverse and inspiring guests. Firstly, if anybody's been fortunate enough to hear or read a deep and meaningful conversation, please let us all know in the comments. Secondly, just by this short statement, we see why Megan's so popular within the popular group. She uses the right buzzwords. Today, buzzwords have become code language. Code to join the popular group. Just like back in grade school, only with much bigger consequences for all people. And it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion, and about trying to shift the global perspective for all of us as a global community. When a person places buzzwords above content, it shows in their line of thinking, and what they say comes out wrong. And in that, yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. Megan's so caught up in buzzwords that she actually makes this so-called empowerment sound like a good thing, which also shows how out of touch she actually is with the people she's paid to say she advocates for. People in these countries think about survival and structure their lives after this most basic goal. They don't have the luxury to think in terms of empowerment. Also, her answer, or lack thereof, calls for the question, what does she actually do? Because traveling to other countries and meeting people can hardly be called work, let alone exhausting. Like if I'm going to have my name attached to it or I'm going to do it, I really get very hands-on, um, which is exhausting, but you can sleep a lot better at night knowing that when you put your thumbprint on it. In this same interview, we got a little more insight into her work. The only problem is that she couldn't make it sound like work. Instead, she described a guided tour. But yeah, I mean, shadowing was crazy. I mean, sitting in 
you know, seeing some of the briefings for what they're going to say to mm -hmm. Ban Ki-moon, our UN Secretary General, and, and understanding how that piece of it works, or understanding different pillars of an organization where they'll say, okay, there's meetings about the environment, and then there's a meeting about health and wellness, and a meeting about safety and security. Megan's word choice indicates that she herself knows that she hasn't done a lot. Because I feel like we see the photos, Yeah. but what is the experience actually like? Um, well, my trip to Rwanda last year was very different because it was just, you know, it was primarily at Parliament. I did go to a refugee camp, though, um, which was my first experience of that. And I think it's, it's being there is a very different experience than what you, you see mm -hmm. on TV. Of course, it impacts you so much so that, you know, this year I was back in Rwanda. I feel very connected to that country now. Um, as Parliament. a word, though, a indicates camp, contrast, though. and by the hesitation and lack of details, she's implying that she didn't do a lot. This point is underlined by her inclusion of and vowel stress on the auxiliary verb did. At also, Parliament. she says it impacts you. So you. This impersonal pronoun points to a general rather than a personal experience. And the most obvious point, she doesn't know how she wants the sentences to end. There's a reason why these people prefer buzzwords and platitudes, because obviously there's not a lot to tell. This year, Megan received another award for Top Entertainment Podcast Host. No, I'm um, okay, I just need a little time, that's all. Okay, I'm ready. I hope you're still with me. Given this predicate, Top Entertainment, I thought it'd be useful to analyze the most revealing parts of this podcast, to discover how the podcast was indeed Top Entertainment, but for all the wrong reasons, at least in the eyes of Megan and Spotify. Before we do, please make sure to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. In the following, we see the self-serving motives that really drive Megan and her friends. Every issue she discusses is about criticism she's faced, personally. Well, technically, no one discusses anything on the podcast. Strangely, the guests have the same beliefs, and they're all dear friends of Megan. From Trudeau's wife, to Paris Hilton, to Serena Williams, and all the other guests, I'm sure. Because as we all know, real friends always feel the need to stress that they're friends, especially to the public. Megan starts every podcast with this, my podcast about the labels and tropes that try to hold women back, living outside the box, the boxes that we try to get pushed inside of, freely expressing our identities, embracing the nuances. What Megan does here is called constitutive rhetoric. This type of rhetoric is used by politicians to constitute an audience simply by presupposing that there is an audience. No one says that anyone in the demographic she's trying to target feels held back and boxed in. It's something she presupposes, and conveniently enough, she never challenges that presupposition, even though this podcast is supposedly about freeing people, which would therefore include her own presuppositions as well. But of course, we can't have that, because without a victim narrative, there'd be no podcast. Megan and her prince both hold on to the victim narrative with everything they've got because it's their main source of income. Without the press that they've made a fortune on complaining about, there'd be no Netflix or Spotify deal. The boxes that we try to get pushed inside of, she says. Just like she alleges that she felt boxed in by being ambitious, as she calls it, when she started dating her now husband. Is it as simple as that, though? People simply couldn't handle her ambitions. It couldn't be because of the underlying sense of entitlement in her complaints, could it? There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. Unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to cross your legs. How no, no, I mean, even, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. <laughs> that's me late at night Googling how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. Or staged and overly dramatic scenes with highly unreliable information. And I wasn't seeing it, but it's almost worse when you feel it through the expression of my mom or my friends or them calling me crying, just like, Meg, they're not protecting you. Or even using the word ambitious in the context of dating Harry. Freely expressing our identity, she says. She says our to make it sound like she's demanding rights on behalf of the audience she's created, which is in line with the ideological effects of constitutive rhetoric. But what she really means is my, because she's talking about herself. 
This kind of newspeak is used by people who want to do whatever they want without taking accountability for their actions. It's a way of countering objections so that if anybody dares hold them accountable, they can then say, you're not letting me express my identity, whatever this even means. I have a problem with you. You're not letting me express my identity. I'm sorry if I... See, there you go again, using labels and tropes to try and hold me back. It wasn't my intention. I... Just let me live outside the box, please. Learn to embrace the nuances, like I do. This is where things start to get very revealing. Megan's talking about being authentic, a word she's unintentionally taught us to be skeptical of, ever since she tried to guide people's opinion of her in the engagement interview. Anything I learned about him and his family was what he would share with me and vice versa. So for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. An interview she's since criticized, to say the least. In your engagement interview, um, <laughs> Orchestrated said. reality show, yeah. This criticism unintentionally shows us that, apparently, she's able to fake being happy and admiring, not to mention the things she said about dating Harry. I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question, I said, well, is he nice? In my opinion, the thing worth noting here isn't that it's completely unthinkable that this was the only question she asked a friend, but that Harry seems so oblivious to what's going on. He looks flattered, even though what Megan says, if we imagine it were true, is a devaluation of him, because being nice is code for being easy to control and being financially well off, but not very exciting. Harry should go on a dating podcast to learn a thing or two. What is your definition of pr oppression? Um, yeah, I just don't know exactly how to, like, why do you want me to explain that? You're just putting me on the spot, you just want to embarrass me. In light of this, it's projection when Megan says, I think most people can sniff out inauthenticity. People can feel it when you're doing that. They can feel it when you're not being yourself. Megan struggles with being perceived as authentic which is why she takes every opportunity to describe who she is and what she does as authentic or organic even. But for me, there was so much more that I wanted to share and I really do have an organic and deep love of travel and of food and... And a passage like this is designed to counter objections. Because she's talked about being inauthentic first, people can't accuse her of being inauthentic. According to this logic, that is. In order to convince herself of this, Megan has to do a lot of pretending. For instance, she has to pretend that people don't know Humblebrag when they see it. Brace yourselves. My license plate in the front was hanging on with a bungee cord, and the clicker wouldn't open the front doors. And I couldn't afford to fix this car, and this was how I got from one audition to the other. For whatever reason, the trunk would still open with the key. Open my trunk, crawl, out crawl the into the back of my car. Suits is not what I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I never thought that I'd have a show that went for this long. That's crazy. The point about her car being old and small is the self-critical, a modest statement she uses to highlight the alleged huge success with the show and her awesome life, just in case the audience had any doubt. She says have a show as opposed to be in a show, as if the show couldn't continue without her, which it did for two more seasons. Before the restart, she was about to say something less positive about Suits, which makes the awesome part sound a lot like overcompensation. Suits is not what I ever... Th the irony of the next passage is striking. Megan talks about how Paris Hilton told her that she was being typecasted because people seem to be drawn to these tropes, this craving to want to judge or gossip or pick apart. Because of course, it's not like Paris Hilton's ever willingly let herself be typecasted. Anything to avoid accountability. By the way, it's a lot more plausible that she wasn't being typecasted, but that her real personality and her personality in the shows were either very similar or identical. Judge, gossip, or pick apart, Megan says. Because as we all know, Megan's never judged anyone. And she's certainly never fed into gossip for self-serving reasons. And I don't say that 
to be disparaging to anyone because I protected that from ever being out in the world. So when you say the reverse happened, explain to us what you mean by that. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something. It made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. As a side note, don't judge is a self-defeating statement because telling someone not to judge is a judgment. Also, we all make hundreds of judgments each day. What to eat, what to watch in television, places to avoid in the cities we live in, etc. Megan's felt boxed in, allegedly, which is why she invited Paris Hilton in the first place, to complain through her. This is the main function of all the guests on this award-winning podcast. Megan complained about not being able to use her intelligence in deal and deal, and we must never doubt her intelligence. That the show only focused on her physical characteristics, which again is an indirect way of saying that she was deemed attractive enough to participate. Finally, this passage teaches us that Megan isn't a fan of open-ended questions. She's talking about TV and reality shows and commands a guest to agree with the extremely leading questions like, wouldn't you say that they start to play into the caricature and they're playing into the type that they've been cast to play, don't you think so? She needs a guest to say yes, because if he doesn't, yes, she actually invited a man on one of the podcasts. The podcast and victim narrative collapse. She would have to actually take accountability, and we can't have that. The next passage is unintentionally funny because it shows a disparity between the ideology Megan's constantly pushing in order to avoid accountability and her guest's own life experience. Megan asks what role men can have to keep women out of this boxed-in stereotyping in movies and television to help keep women's stories told in an authentic way. The exact kind of authenticity that Megan's narrative is lacking, which is why she constantly has to emphasize that it's authentic. The guest answers that most of the executive producers and the housewives are women, and that all of his mentors have been women. Where are the boxes, labels, and tropes? Isn't the demographic that Megan's paid inordinate amounts of money to say she advocates for allowed to express their identities freely? And that's the point. In reality, Megan has no real demographic in mind because the very demographic she advocates for is already involved in movies and television, even in many of the movies and shows that she claims box them in, even though they're doing it of their own accord. Unintentionally, then, Megan's the one placing her demographic in a box, telling them how to think, the exact opposite of what she claims this podcast is about. In the end, we're left with Megan. This podcast is all about damage control. The guests are merely instruments to tell her idealized life story. And in the next passage, she almost makes this point too obvious. Did I say almost? She makes this point too obvious. Megan claims that there's an unspoken annoyance around women in activism, that this isn't new but has been going on for a long time. She's talking about herself but uses plural in order to associate herself with the audience she's constituted, but which didn't exist prior to her saying it exists. In order to strengthen her narrative and thus persuade people, Megan needs this to have been going on for a long time. This is in line with the ideological effects of constitutive rhetoric, to make it seem like this audience existed for a long time, and it's the same today as it was years ago. Never mind different societal structures. Most people haven't had the luxury to think in terms of activism, and still don't. But this again shows how Megan deliberately views the past through the lens of today. It's a privileged, anachronistic view, which she shares with many other authentic celebrities and politicians. Also, this isn't true. A lot of activism receives praise, and rightfully so. It all comes down to what the activists have actually done, and how big a need they have to emphasize their own efforts. The United Nations wants to work with me because I wrote this thing on my blog. But they did. Um... The activists who do the most work are often the ones getting the least public recognition. These people wouldn't even refer to themselves as activists. Along with philanthropist, activist has become a buzzword used by celebrities and Megan. She says labeling someone as difficult becomes a way to take their power away, keep them in their place. And a lot of times it's tied to the very women who have power and agency. 
She's referring to herself, but doesn't say it. She has married into power and agency, and she's been labeled difficult, to say the least. And of course, people can never have a point in labeling someone. It's not like these labels can ever be true, right? That's what Megan wants her audience, if we pretend it exists, to think. This way, in her view, she can attack a nameless, faceless group of people in order to avoid having to question her own morality or behavior. So when Megan ironically says how very convenient, it's more projection, because in reality, she's the one making self-serving, convenient conclusions. With the claims she makes, she can never be wrong. Only people who label her can be wrong. Harry uses this tactic as well, albeit not as authentically and organically as his better half. Next, it's time for the inevitable emotionalism in any monologue that uses constitutive rhetoric. As if we weren't crying already. Megan claims, there's a piece of art in my sitting room, it's not fancy, by which she portrays herself as modest, down to earth and similar cliches. My dear friend Genevieve gave it to me. I forgot that she was a dear friend too, sorry. And then, notice the extreme amount of repetitions for emotional effect, pathos. Megan obviously thinks that it makes what she's saying sound authentic and natural, but it actually makes it sound contrived and deeply cliched. Humankind, be both. You're not just a human being. You're a human, just being. You're human, just being. The space to be a human, being. That's what we are, human beings. Humans, just being. Humankind, be both. You're not just a human being. You're a human, just being. You're human, just being. The space to be a human, being. That's what we are, human beings. Humans, just being. Unintentionally, I think, Megan actually revealed the technique she's using here in her Women of Vision speech, which was deemed powerful by her influential friends in the media. Megan said repetition is recognition, which is a strategy politicians use. When a person hears something enough times, he or she will start to think it's true. At least, that's what these people are counting on. A passage like this truly deserves an award, but not for the reasons Megan thinks. I haven't even heard something like this in a B-movie. Not even The Room had this kind of monologue. You know what they say, love is blind. No labels, no types, no masks, outside the box, just all natural, all you. Even though she's the one creating these labels and boxes for anyone who opposes what she or her dear friend stand for. Also, Megan's put on a mask more than once, so it's interesting that this word is on her mind. With short sentences like these, Megan doesn't think highly of the people who would actually find inspiration in something like this. And she might have a point there. She claims women's emotions are used against them, but maybe if men were more outward with their emotions, that expression would be less stigmatized. Stigmatized. Another one of my favorites from the handbook of meaningless buzzwords. Notice what Megan's actually saying here. She claims to want men to be more emotional, something we've heard ever since the late 1960s because it's part of the narrative that Megan and like-minded people have to keep alive for monetary reasons. Not because it benefits them, but because it benefits her demographic. So, she wants both demographics to have their emotions used against them, until it magically becomes less stigmatized, which will never happen because people like Megan need stigmas to keep the agenda going and the money flowing. But I guess, from Megan's perspective, two wrongs really do make a right. Final point, if this guy is the example of Megan's definition of a modern man that we all know Megan doesn't really want, I don't recommend taking her advice. This is how you win awards today, apparently. Style over substance, emotions over logic, and fairy tales over truth. The party is over. Like and subscribe for more videos.